Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Gil Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, how to live longer, better life. We are produced by InstaTracker, your science-based guide to optimize your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Andrea Mayer. Andrea Mayer is the co-director of the Center of Healthy Longevity at the National University of Singapore. She received her MD in 2003 from the University of Lübeck in Germany. From 2016 to early 2021, Professor Mayer served as a Divisional Director of Medicine and Community Care at the Royal Marlborough Hospital, Australia, and a Professor of Medicine and Aged Care at the University of Marlborough. Professor Mayer research focus on uh, revealing the mechanism of aging and age-related diseases. During the last 10 years, she has conducted multiple international observational cohort studies and intervention trials, and has published more than 350 peer-reviewed articles. She is a frequent guest at, on a radio and television program to disseminate aging research and invited a member of several international academic and health policy committee, including the WHO. She is the president of the Australian and New Zealand Society of Sarcopenia and Fertility, Research and Service I, as a selected member of the Royal Holland Society of Science and Humanity. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me and spending the time. Thank you. So I would like to start with a, a brief introduction about uh, yourself and specifically, why have you decided to become a physician and scientist and how have you got uh, involved in uh, studying uh, aging and longevity? I grew up in a GP practice. <laughs> I think that says a lot. So it's in my genes. Uh, my father and my mother were, uh, were working there. And uh, so it, it was quite clear that in the end, I would become an MD. However, I wanted to study art and I wanted to have that liberal life. Uh, but in the end, that did not happen. Um, why aging and why geriatrics first? And then I moved much more to the aging uh, field from a clinical perspective. I always did research in the aging field. That's because I was just fascinated by old age and especially fascinated by old age in good health. So I had a couple of people surrounding me in the 90s who were in such a good shape. I thought, okay, we have to study what's going on. And that's what I do since 20 years. Excellent. And uh, I know, and I'm not sure that the audience know that you are working together with Brian Kennedy, which uh, is a, a, a dear friend and uh, been a, a guest in this podcast. And uh, basically the first graduate student at the Lenny Rental Lab that uh, started working on aging. So uh, uh, definitely you are uh, working in a, a great place uh, uh, in Singapore and the, the two of you are doing uh, amazing work there. And I would like to uh, start our discussion on a longevity medicine clinic. And uh, maybe just as the first question, most of our audience, I assume, doesn't know what are longevity medical clinics. It's a pretty new term. And uh, how can you describe it? And what is the uh, difference between normal or traditional medicine clin uh, clinic and longevity medicine? Yeah, I'm a trained uh, internal medicine physician and geriatrician as subspeciality. And what we normally do, and we are doing it quite well, and we should be proud of it, we are treating individuals who have a disease following the ICD-11 or 10 code. So that's the International Classification of Diseases. So that's normal practice we grew up with, and I manage lots of hospitals um, in really regulating that really fantastic care. However, we are aging already from, some say, from conception. Some say you can really show it uh, in the 20s or 30s birthday, but we are aging quite rapidly um, at, at middle age. And what we already know that 
some of the, our organ systems are declining and declining all the time. And at a certain point, we say, hey, you have a disease, so you should go to an endocrinologist or to a, to a surgeon or whatever. We have so many specialities. And health and longevity medicine is kicking in before we are going to see an endocrinologist or a lung physician or a, another physician being highly experienced in, in organ dysfunction. So we are looking at the functioning of the body. And of course, we should also provide that service to individuals and their healthy longevity medicine clinics uh, come to the game. And these are quite new. Uh, I must say there are no healthy longevity medicine physicians. Lots of individuals call themselves um, a longevity uh, medicine physicians, but it's not yet recognized by any society medical society yet. And that's what we try to achieve with the Health and Longevity Medicine Society um, to really get uh, medical specialities being recognized. So it's a very early field to really work on prevention and to recognize that our body is already aging during the life course. And at a certain point, your disease prevent that. Yeah. So one anecdote, I remember uh, when I was on my... Uh... 30s, my wife came to me and said, hey, I have an age mark uh, on my body. And I told her, uh, unfortunately, the point that you are today is the best point that you will be ever in the future. So basically, it's all downhill from that. She didn't like it, but that's the reality at the end of the day. So that's one anecdote. The second one is uh, uh, just trying to summarize uh, what you said in my uh, uh, voice. So basically, uh, uh, longevity clinics help with preventions. And bring the best of your body, best of your body. So basically bring you to the best that you can uh, uh, reach. That's, that's a fair uh, assessment. Uh, yeah, we have a definition for uh, healthy longevity and there was what the clinics do. So healthy longevity uh, medicine is optimizing the health span while targeting the aging processes across the life course. Okay. So there are a couple of components here. So it's, it's about health span to optimize health span. It's about aging mechanisms, we now understand, and it's across the line for us, which means it's very um, integrative in, in, in everybody's life because everybody is welcome in such clinics to optimize health span. Okay. Now, the question about who is the right uh, client or consumer for the longevity clinics? Basically, can you... If uh, uh, one of our listeners thinking, should I go to longevity clinic or should I stay with my uh, normal uh, primary physician? How, what, what are the advice that will tell him to decide whether to go left or right? Yeah, you don't have to, I wouldn't say you have to choose. It's either left okay. or it's either right. I think we can learn a lot from GP practices. I just said I grew up in a GP practice. So there's lots of good preventative stuff going on there. Think about vaccinations. Think about measuring um, the weights of babies, uh, for example. This is all prevention um, and risk stratification that we prevent nature-related disease much, 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 much later in life. So it's, it's not either or. Um, very important is that we are targeting, I would say, health in longevity medicine a little bit different. We have other tools than a normal GP at the moment has. And then I'm talking about biological age clocks, looking, for example, at epigenetic markers or the omics approach to look at really new biomarkers, which are not yet readily available in normal conventional uh, healthcare. So our diagnostics is a little bit different, but most importantly, also our interventions are, are quite, quite different to lower the biological age. What kind of supplements work to lower the biological age or maybe even what kind of repurposed drugs work to lower the biological age? So, and that's very different. I wouldn't say that I have never seen a GP um, really stating, okay, what is your biological age? That's really the diagnostic tool for longevity medicine uh, physicians. Um, but again, coming back, it's not either or. I think we shouldn't throw away or we shouldn't say GP practices are not good enough anymore. Absolutely not. It's really the, the basis of a wonderful healthcare service, at least in the in Western countries. And uh, we should work with them and not against them or next to them. That's great. And uh, again, to summarize, so there are a different uh, 
or more advanced tools for diagnostic and the intervention might be a bit more advanced or a bit more gear into looking into longevity, which is great. And the, related to the clocks, we'll discuss them later. Uh, and definitely it's uh, one subject that I want to go very deep. So I, I want to uh, shift gear with you and uh, discuss about uh, more about mechanism of uh, aging. And uh, we know that uh, there have been a few papers that uh, looked at uh, a few different uh, mechanisms that can uh, cause aging and the specific uh, area that we might be able to intervene. So in your opinion, is it a, a specific mechanism for aging for each person that we can pinpoint into? Or right now they are very general, and like, like senescence uh, or oxidative stress or telomere shortening are uh, applicable for everyone? I, I think I have a personal opinion <laughs> and I okay. know what uh, has been written in the literature. And I think a lot of people already know that we have hallmarks of aging and um, in publications, the number of these hallmarks, they differ and they're, they are varying. Um, I grew up uh, that we have nine hallmarks of aging. I think we have many, many more, and they're also interacting. Um, your question is, okay, does somebody have a telomere problem or a proteostasis problem or more problems with mitochondria or much more DNA damage? Because these are all the hallmarks of aging. I would say we do not know. We are not yet there at the personalized approach that we say, okay, you have a telomere problem. That's the reason why I'm injecting telomerase. Don't do that at this moment in time. Absolutely no evidence. We do not have the evidence that other people might suffer from a proteostasis problem and therewith uh, have to get medication who are interfering with specifically folding proteins, for example. But what we know is that the contribution of these hallmarks are different between individuals. So what does that mean? That some people might have less senescent cells um, compared to others, but might have different problems. And to make it even more complicated, um, that's between individuals. But within one individual, it might be that our heart or my heart might suffer from different aging processes compared to my brain or to my lungs, depending on what kind of environmental damage there is, for example. Um, smoking, I absolutely do not smoke, but if I would smoke, I would expose my lungs to toxins, which heavily uh, are associated with um, a ROS, for example, and therewith give lots of DNA damage, and therewith also more propensity for cancer. So dependent on within an individual, the organ you are targeting, the mechanisms might also be different based on how it's used and how, how much and when we expose these organs to, to negative influences. Okay. That's, that's a great answer. And uh, focusing or zooming in into the senescent sense. So do we know if there are specific diseases that are more prone to senescent uh, cells than the uh, other that are less? Yeah, that's a great question. So the senescent cells are the cells who are not dividing. We think they are not dividing anymore, still in the body and very likely negatively influencing the microenvironment. And there was inducing lots of age-related diseases um, under which cancer. That's the hypothesis. We did lots of research in the past to see if individuals with age-related diseases has a higher senescence load, so more senescent cells in, for example, the skin, but also in the lungs, in the brain, um, everywhere where researchers did, um, did investigations uh, on. And what we were able to see is that the senescence load is uh, much, much higher with chronological age. That's what we expect, because that's also the reason why it's a hallmark of aging. On the other hand side, individuals of the same chronological age, but with an age related disease, have many more senescent cells in their body and independent of the organ where the disease is. So if you take, for example, blood from patients with heart failure and compare them to individuals of the same age and sex without a heart failure, these individuals have 
for example, in the blood, but also in the heart, much more senescent cells. So it goes with chronological age, but also with a biological age, um, and then determined by age-related diseases. You ask which disease? That's a little bit tricky um, because there are not many studies who do really a um, comparison in, in one group, how many more uh, you find in, for example, kidney transplant uh, patients. So we do not know. But what we know is that the senescence load in, for example, the pancreas and then bra in the brain is much higher compared to other organs such as the colon uh, or the thymus, which also makes sense because they are not repetitive anymore, for example, the thymus much, much later in life. And what can we do? Let's assume that the a specific person uh, somehow identified that he has uh, a lot of senescent cells in a, a specific organ. I know that today you cannot do a lot, but if we will uh, uh, fast forward five or 10 years uh, into the future, what in your opinion will be the intervention to treat those senescent cells? Yeah, first of all, there is already not a treatment, but there is prevention. So there are already a couple of studies showing that with lifestyle interventions, for example, being on a treadmill for three times a week for 30 minutes reduces the number of senescent cells in blood. So we already know that we can manipulate the number of senescent cells. If we therewith also reduce the risk of an age related disease, I don't know. But what we know is that the numbers are changing while having better lifestyle habits. And I think that's very, very important. I think you are targeting a little bit more the uh, supplement and the, the, the drugs, how to remove senescent cells. So these are the senolytics, really um, interfering with senescent cells, either inducing apoptosis or the programmed cell deaths of these individuals. These are indeed already in um, phase one and phase uh, two A uh, studies where it's tested in, in humans to see, of course, we see hypothesis. If you have an accumulation of senescent cells, these are bad for the environment. They give a higher risk of age-related diseases. Let's remove them. And there are a couple of these drugs are being tested. Um, a couple of phase one studies show that the side effects are uh, okay, um, but the definitive studies to actually see if they have an effect uh, on removing cells, um, that might be possible, but there was also having a clinically relevant effect we don't know yet. So there, there are a couple of, of, I think, years to go until we know if they are clinically meaningful. We also have to consider that every um, medication, every drug has an effect. That's the reason why we give it. But as a physician, I also would like to highlight that if there is an effect, most of the times there is also a side effect. Because that's the reason why it works. And we do not really know how many senescent cells we possibly need in our, in our body because they are senescent to um, suppress, for example, cancer because that cell cannot divide, but with side effects for the environment. So we have to learn, I think, how much effect we will gain by giving senolytics. Um, also, when to give them? Should we start in our 30s or 50s or 70s? We absolutely do not know yet and will take time, especially in earlier ages. And we also have to learn how many side effects uh, we, will, we will have to then have a gain risk ratio to actually see if it makes sense to give these kind of senolytics. Yeah, that's a very important point. And uh, I remember as a, a graduate student at the Weizmann Institute long ago, I worked actually on uh, senescent cells and the dogma there was that uh, they are actually there uh, in order to prevent cancer because the telomeres are shortening and then uh, uh, if not, uh, they become uh, mutated and become a uh, cancer cell. So it's definitely a point to keep in mind. And I think that the, 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 the important take home message for uh, everyone is, uh, as you said, every uh, drug has an effect, but it also has a most likely side effect. And we need to be careful not to jump on a specific uh, drug that someone uh, post on uh, Twitter and they uh, start using it off target because someone said it. Be sure that it's uh, safe and uh, uh, I don't know, go the FDA approval or something like that before you're taking a drug off target. Be careful. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. I think um, uh, being also on Twitter and on LinkedIn, sometimes I see messages where I think, hmm, 
I'm not sure if that's a good message <laughs> to communicate to, to, to the crowd and very often laymen, um, because it's quite easy to get drugs um, yeah. already uh, via different sources. <laughs> and that's the hero stuff. <laughs> In the black market, um, let's say. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think experimenting with yourself has, has risks. Some take the risk, but uh, please be careful in, um, in building a crowd out of it. And yeah. just uh, I would, would highlight there are lots of randomized controlled trials, lots of trials. Look at um, the trial registry and just be in contact with researchers and there will be a sufficient and a very nice trial also for you. Yeah. So, so my next question is more about uh, zooming out from the cellular level into the uh, organ level and uh, ask you a question about, do you see that the uh, different organs age differently in the different pace? And uh, if yes, which of them uh, age fastest and which of them age slowest? Um, you always uh, ask questions which I cannot answer. <laughs> At least the second question, I, I cannot um, really That's answer. Okay. But what we know is that the pace of aging within a body is, is different. So we use a huge database, UK Biobank, with more than 150,000 individuals. And we took only individuals who are healthy. And we looked at trajectories of decline of organs in these individuals. And what we were able to, to do is a network analysis to say, okay, in the first six years um, of the data we had, what kind of function of the organ is declining and what kind of organ is following? And that's very, very important because if we understand what the trajectory is of decline in a body, we can also then do diagnostics very specifically for, for a certain organ. We found, for example, that the lung function, if the lung function is going down um, in the first six years of follow-up, that's very highly associated with decline in a cardiac function in the next six years. However, in participants where the heart function was going down, there was not the decline in lung function, which means that there is not a bidirectional um, association, but the one way association, which also means if you are thinking about the normal healthcare services we already have, you say, okay, if I have an individual with a declining lung function, it would be very good to also have a cardiac function test later in life and to prevent, uh, for example, uh, heart failure. On the other hand side, if somebody visits the cardiologist, that doesn't mean that per se, that person has to go to the pulmonologist because it's just one, one direction. And what we also found is that especially the muscle, the musculoskeletal system is very important in that network and is really highly interconnected. So if the muscle function and the muscle mass is going down, that's never a good sign. That is the precursor of lots of other organs also declining. So from a GP perspective, there was, it's very important to measure muscle strength and muscle mass already now in clinical practice, because I like the clinical part to be implemented uh, if we already have knowledge and the musculoskeletal system is very important and very easy to measure. That's very interesting. And the question is, do we, uh, my next question is, do we see a variability in organ aging between humans, meaning can my lung age faster than yours, but your muscle will age faster? Is it something that we see or can we see it? Yes, we, we, we can see that. And I think that's also the reason why there are groups of individuals with more cardiovascular related diseases at the age of 60 versus some with more neurodegenerative uh, disease, for example, uh, dementia. So they're absolutely trained in tribes, traits, tribes of individuals who might suffer from different, and we are now coming back to the hallmarks of aging, traits of which hallmarks are more pronounced, which then lead to certain um, age-related diseases in certain organs. And there's absolutely a, a variation uh, in how humans age. 
So for the next coming five to 10 years, I think for us is to understand how we can measure that. So then very individualized intervene for these individuals that we really treat the ones who need to be treated for certain aging-related uh, functional declines in certain organs. Excellent. And that's a great segue for the aging clock. So I would like to start by you explaining to our audience in the simplest way as possible. What are the aging clocks? What are the origin for them? And why are we using them? Yeah. I would say aging clocks are a little bit, sorry, a hype. <laughs> so um, it's just nice and it's, it's very sexy to say, okay, we have a diagnostic, so we call it clock and everybody understands it. At least it seems to be very fascinating for the audience um, and for, for clients. So clocks are nothing else than comparing a parameter which we can measure in the body and compare that in the first instance to the chronological age. So how is a 40-year-old doing compared to another 40-year-old? That's it. So it's very easy. It's just repurposing data we already had and then expressing it um, as a clock. And the unit of a clock is years. That's it. You are biologically younger, three years, five years, one and a half years, whatever, compared to a certain individual of the same chronological age. So these were the investigations, and we call them the, the first generation clock. I don't think that these have, these, of course, they have value, but trying to compare somebody to the same age group, I think we already did 30 or 40 years ago. What's much more important is to see an other biological characteristics in the body. It can be the blood pressure, it can be an epigenetic makeup, it can be a glucose, can be lots of variables. Are these variables predictive in the future for bad outcome? And the bad outcome can be mortality, so death, or it can be the incidence of a disease. And these are the second generation clocks. So these are trains to predict a bad outcome. And there, for me at least, becomes much more relevant because I, as a clinician, I want to prevent that bad outcome. And I want to know who is at risk for that bad outcome. And that person at risk for the bad outcome therewith has a higher biological age using that clock. Mm -hmm. And so that's the entire rational and framework. So the first generation clocks uh, are trained to predict the chronological age. The second generation clocks are predicting uh, the bad outcomes. And what are the, the variables we are including? There are lots. We have a muscle clock. We have a brain clock. We have a, a blood clock. Uh, we have an epigenetic clock. There are lots of clocks. And I think that's also a little bit the trouble of our field, if I uh, may, uh, because there are so many clocks that nobody really knows um, how, how the time is ticking <laughs> because all the clocks are also quite, quite different. Um, and I think you will ask me maybe, what is my favorite clock? You saved my question, so let's answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have, I must say, I don't have a personally a, a favorite clock. Um, from an academic point of view, I want an accurate clock. And now, of course, the question, what is the most accurate clock? And I think the opinions um, are a little bit diverse in the field. I would say that I only accept a diagnostic marker in clinical practice to use it if the accuracy is at least 80-90% with a high sensitivity and a high specificity. Um, do these clocks have that yet? No, we don't know. Because most of the times we are just looking at associations and say, a three years younger individual has two times lesser risk of death, for example. That doesn't mean that, that for that person, um, the clock is accurate because it's just an association and the association is on group level. So what we need in our field is many more studies where we really look at accuracy and looking at not only the area under the curve, um, but also a sensitivity and specificity and um, a predicted values, positive and negative ones. Excellent. And the 
A follow-up question that is a bit uh, geeking uh, out and uh, talking a bit more about statistics, but I think that it's important here, is related to the R value of the clock. So theoretically, you can get to R value of one, but that's a, a bit limitation because uh, actually I would like you to explain to the audience why it's a limitation if the correlation between the clock age and your chronological age is a one-to-one. What what happened? Why why it's not good? Why we don't what would like to have a bit more stability? Yeah. So the first generation clocks are there to be trained to as best as possible predict chronological age. And if it's a R value, so the correlation coefficient is one. That means that the biological age is the same as the chronological age. That does not make sense because you want a diagnostic tool to say what your biological age is. And otherwise you can just look at the passport. That's your age and that's a chronological age. So I'm always very happy um, if I have to review papers or see slides where an R value is being given of a 0.7. Most of the times then it says, oh, the R value is, is low. And I say, yes, this is good. So I would like to have a clock which is not predictive um, is an, an R value of one for chronological age, but around a point, point 0.7 roughly. A point 0.8 is also very good already predicting chronological age. That's not the purpose. Because I would like to see that the biological clock is associated with biological variance. So I need a variance of the biological age varying around that chronological age range. And that's most important. And then I have something in hand, which could also be sensitive to change. If I do an intervention, I would be, for example, five years older. I do a certain intervention. I would like to see that that age gap between the biological and the chronological age of minus five goes to minus four, three, two, et cetera. And then I know that my intervention worked. If the R value would be one, then I would just stay at my chronological age. That's, that was a very good and a simple explanation. Thank you so much. I think that it's a uh, very important for our audience. And uh, recently I uh, listened to your uh, presentation and uh, you develop a, a clock, which I assume around 120 different features that are uh, more, mostly clinical features. And in that uh, regard, you, you showed which one, uh, uh, which feature is the most uh, predictor or making you the young, younger and uh, a few that make you older. And I'm sure that it's very interesting for the audience to know if they can take something out of this uh, discussion. What are the activities that people are doing that make them or make most of us older? And what are the activities that make uh, most of us younger? Can you give us a few tips about that? Uh, yes. So we designed the clocks based on physical parameters, which means measuring the blood pressure, uh, looking at the cholesterol level. So everything every GP could already do, which is great. And then we said, okay, individuals with a higher or a lower biological age, um, what kind of characteristics do they have? And one of the very surprising characteristics, but very logical characteristics is if somebody is younger, that's associated, for example, with more green space around that person where a person is living. And of course, that makes sense because you are very likely not living in a very crowded uh, city. You have more space to do exercises and to walk, etc. But also social connectivity is very important. So individuals who say, yes, I have friends are biologically younger compared to the ones who do say, okay, yeah, my, my friends are limited to one or two and I'm, I'm socially isolated, for example. And there are other factors like lifestyle factors. If the sleep quality is the impression of that individual that the sleep quality is poor, that's also associated with a higher biological age, et cetera, et cetera. So all the obvious things, but I like the obvious things to then go and have a good conversation with politicians to say, okay, what do we do with this information? And how do we shape the environment that we could, of course, uh, likely influence that biological age characteristic of lots of individuals living there? And of course, this is not causally related, but this is what we are doing in Singapore at the moment 
to actually see, can we do research when increasing the green space or in making differences and changes in the, in the environment where people live to actually prove that people are biologically younger in the end? Yeah. And, and I think that they, that's a very good point about taking a basic research as you've done uh, about the clocks and that now moving into public health and uh, going to a government. And in that regard, Singapore, I think that is the leading in uh, being uh, reactive to science and, uh, and like science and pu pushing it to the population. I know that uh, a lot of other governments are less uh, flexible about that, but I, I think that that's great. It can be a great example or a, a pilot for all of us all over the world. What, uh, what can we do based on science and then uh, testing it in a, 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 a country that is in the size of city and uh, uh, see what are, uh, is it really working or not? Is it just an assumption of a scientist, which is uh, really amazing. And, and thank you for, so much for sharing that. In the same presentation, you also show that you develop a, a organ clock. So you look at a, a few different organs and, uh, and uh, basically measure the clock of uh, each of them. Can you elaborate about, a bit about that and what uh, were the discoveries that they, or what were the exciting discoveries from uh, uh, the organ specific clocks? Yeah. So the, the underlying question is, um, do we need, or is there a purpose for organ specific clocks or can we just use one clock and that's a body clock? So the question is. And if there are organ specific clocks, which clock and which organ is ticking well? So which one to use? Um, and that was the entire exercise to compare different organ specific clocks, for example, a heart clock, a lung clock, a brain clock, and then compare that to an overall clock. And we compared them by judging how good they are to predict age related diseases. And what we found is that all organ specific clocks, they are quite okay and good to predict age related diseases, even in other organ systems. However, the body clock was much, much better in as a second generation clock in predicting uh, age related diseases, but also in mortality. And I think that's interesting, which means we already touched on this. Do organs, do they age differently? Yes, they do. That's also the reason why the organ specific clocks give a little bit different results uh, within an individual. But if we are looking at an overall outcome, for example, mortality, then the overall health, the overall biological clock is uh, much more predictive um, compared to all of these tiny clocks, which means also from a clinical perspective, I think we have to introduce a more global clock. If the global clock is showing that the biological age is higher, then we can do a deep dive into different organs to see where is the origin of that accelerated aging process. Okay, good. And uh, again, uh, just to summarize this part, uh, you develop a clock that is based on uh, features that coming from a, a regular GP or data that is a uh, medical grade. There are a lot of clocks right now, and the most important one is the epigenetic clock that coming based on a, a methylation of your uh, DNA. They have been shown to be the most accurate, but they are less, uh, again, my interpretation is there less interaction or less knowledge why they are predictive of uh, aging or longevity or anything else. So I would like to hear from you, if you can. I know that it's a very sensitive uh, subject in the aging research domain, but you, you, what is your interpretation of the epigenetic clock, which have the highest amount of buzz right now? I'm absolutely not political. So the only thing which <laughs> counts is what, where's the evidence? And there's absolutely a hype. Uh, we also use in my lab the epigenetic clocks and using at the moment five different algorithms. So I love the epigenetic clock. But again, I'm not sure how accurate that is. I'm not very convinced if we really need to know why um, of what really happens, which CPG sites are methylated and why it's, it's so good. At a clinician, um, I need a biomarker, which is sensitive. Uh, for a certain outcome, so it has to be accurate. So even yellow fingers are a very good biomarker for lung cancer. <laughs> so 
if I don't say that this holds also for the average genetic clock, um, but not always using a biomarker, causality has to be proven. From an academic perspective, of course, I would like to know why um, the epigenetic clock is so predictive, for example, for the incidence of diabetes and mortality. And they're really working, working well. What we don't know yet for the epigenetic clocks is, of course, why um, and how sensitive they are for change. And I, with my group, we are jumping at the moment in very cold water. <laughs> um, we are doing trials where we have is not only a selection parameter of inclusion, we are including 40 to 60 year old individuals, but we only include individuals who are healthy. However, these healthy individuals have a higher biological age based on the epigenetic clock, based on four different uh, algorithms we apply to that. And then we make a composite score. And this is also our outcome parameter, which means that hopefully there is enough change during our course of the intervention that we see a result. And I think nobody really knows. But I think the power of the epigenome or the entire methylation is so fantastic because we already know that our lifestyle really has a sort of fingerprint on our DNA and can switch on and off genes and they can modify gene desert. And what that really means in terms of health outcomes, we don't know. But what is so exciting, and that's the reason why I always have a big smile if I hear about epigenetics, is that it's modifiable. And that's what we want in clinical care. We want modifiable factors we can easily measure. And lots of investigations around the world are now uh, looking at, okay, if one CPC site is being methylated, what does it mean and in which condition? And I think that's the next step. For now, I think it's the biomarker to introduce in clinical practice, which I already did and uh, I'm going to do. Uh, in the coming months. Yeah, that's a, actually a great segue for my next question. So if a, a physician or a longevity physician or a practitioner would like to add the aging clock into his or her practice, what you recommend them to do? What is the right step to do it? It depends on the embedding of that physician. Um, if you have uh, an academic lab next to your clinic, which most often is not available, <laughs> then yes, uh, please measure epigenetic ages, etc. cetera. Um, what I would suggest is um, very easy measures in the beginning um, as a kickoff and start off of physicians who would like to measure the biological age. One very uh, easy one is measuring the pathology data you would already do. So measuring a liver function, creatinine, et cetera. And there are a couple of algorithms already to therewith measure and calculate the biological age out of um, hematological and uh, other parameters, which is, I think, the first step. How sensitive these are in terms of change is also not really known, but you can at least use that a diagnosticum when you have the first conversation with your client and saying, okay, you're tracking towards an older age, younger age, uh, et cetera, but very easy parameters. And um, for example, a, a muscle strength and uh, gait analysis is already very informative. If you have the lab in hand, uh, yeah, go for uh, epigenetic makeups, go for measuring um, the genetic uh, contribution of that individuals go and and have an, an omic approach etc but I would say that I only know a couple of, of clinics which are able to do that and not even sure if that's very accurate okay thank you so much for that and uh, my, my next question you partially answer it but I think that it will be good to spend some time on that so you, you said that uh, at least for the epigenetic clock, they can predict if uh, you will have uh, diabetes or uh, a, a different disease. So what is your view about that? Can uh, uh, we look at uh, uh, whatever clock you have and then they come and say, 
because you are older than your age, you have a, a 2x chance to have diabetes or cardiovascular diseases or any other diseases, so we are not there yet. I would say we, we are not there yet. What we first have to do in, in clinical practice to implement the risk scorings we already have in hands, which are validated, which are quite accurate. So I would never say now we have clocks. So therewith, we do not have to measure a glucose or a fructosamine or an HB1AC. Don't do that because they are very good markers for an incident of diabetes. Where the biological clock kicks in is in addition to the conventional markers of cardiovascular disease. So none of the clocks work better than measuring, for example, the blood pressure in millimeter mercury um, to predict if somebody has hypertension. Of course, you have to measure that organ, the vascular system, to actually see if it's working or not. So I really see the entire development of longevity medicine embedded and not separated, but embedded into internal medicine because we learned that the last 50 to 100 years so much. Let's do not throw that away because we have clocks and that's very attractive and that sells nice, but we have to embed it in care, which is already good and a very high standard and and test if the combinations uh, work and they are better. Uh, now we'll give you one example. So we have um, a cardiovascular risk screening where we are measuring an LDL and we are measuring the blood pressure and the BMI, et cetera. And then there's a certain risk. What kind of studies I would like to see in the field is then adding our risk, uh, our biological clocks to see if we are predicting much, much better there with cardiovascular risk. Um, so now we very often test our biological clocks in isolation, but let's then either compete or add them towards the risk factors we already know. And I think that would really gain lots of information and transform care embedded, but not isolated. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. A very good uh, suggestion and the uh... I agree with you that uh, some of the clock are a bit, uh, they are over-promised right now and we need to be careful about the interpretation of that. So, uh, Andrew, I, I would like to finish by a, a question that we are asking every guest that we have. And uh, the, the, the tip is, what uh, do you uh, recommend to do in order to improve health span or specifically what do you do in order to live uh, uh, better longer? I think I'm an outsider in this field. <laughs> I do not take any supplements. I do not take uh, any Rapalox or repurposed drugs. No, I don't do that because I'm a hardcore scientist. And I first want to have my randomized controlled trials uh, to be able to see what kind of effect I gain. Uh, that's from a supplement and repurposed drug perspective. So I do not self-experiment uh, with these kind of things. You won't see me on Twitter saying, yes, I did this and that. Uh, on the other hand side, I think I have a very, very good uh, diet. I love French fries on Fridays, but on the other hand side, I'm already for decades a uh, vegetarian and without knowing this would increase my health span. Um, but, but this is not very important because I see lots of my colleagues uh, running around and being on treadmills etc. I think most importantly is for me that I love my work and therewith I am happy. I have a very uh, nice environment. I live, I have a dog and a husband and that makes me me happy. And this is, um, sorry to, to be very personal, but I think this is very important also for our field. We are really looking at the functionality of our body and what we should really try to do in our investigations to have many more associations and investigations with health psychologists to actually see how we can notch individuals into the right direction, not only of the behavior, but also to enjoy life. That's an excellent tip and uh, a unique one. And uh, I really like it. Don't run after the new drug that uh, some, someone said in Twitter, but uh, go to the basic, 
love your work, do your work well, love your family, spend time with them, and uh, maybe have a dog. That's a, that's a, a unique one, which is, uh, yeah, I, I know that people with dogs are much more friendly. So maybe it's connected to the friendliness, what you said, and maybe to get the green area, because when you have a dog, you need to take him outside, uh, which is a, a great a connection to your uh, epigenetic clock uh, part. So Andra, that was a, a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to exploring the research uh, in the field of lo longevity each once, each month with uh, you and the leading scientists. For more information, please go to insotracker.com slash podcast. Thank you so much again, Andre. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.